afternoon and welcome to all of you who have joined us today. We're expecting a total audience of about 100 or so. A uh, really wonderful response to our 2021-22 lecture series, uh, Out of the Box, Stories from Our Collections. And we are really delighted today to have a really fascinating program that you'll hear a little bit more about from Paula, who's going to introduce our speaker. So uh, my name is Eileen McIntyre, and I chair the education committee that is responsible for bringing you this lecture series. Um, and this is our first hybrid program. Uh, so bear with us, but we think we've nailed the technology. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Paula Bagger, who is the president of our society. Paula. Thank you, Eileen. And I never say in advance that we've nailed the technology. I think that's bad, bad luck. Um, but welcome everyone, both those who are here in the room and those participating uh, via Zoom to this first hybrid lecture of our uh, Historical Society lecture series. Before we get started, I wanna thank our Hingham Historical Society Education Committee uh, for uh, developing and uh, working so hard on this lecture series. And in particular, Eileen McIntyre and Ruth Gilbert Whitner, uh, who spearheaded the effort for this first lecture in the series. I also wanna give a big thank you to Deirdre Anderson, our executive director. Again, Eileen and the education committee and our tech consultant, Colin McGinnis, for hard work on figuring out how to respond to these uncertain times. Uh, by uh, presenting this uh, lecture series, uh, both in person and uh, over Zoom. Deirdre, by the way, texted me. She is, she feels badly she's not here. She was in a rest stop in Burlington, Vermont on her way home from her eldest son's uh, you know, freshman weekend. So she has a very good excuse. And she was planning to try and watch this on Zoom as they drove through the uh, Green Mountains, so I'm not sure how well that's going to work for her, but uh, we're thinking of her and uh, wish she was here. So I'm excited to provide an introduction to our first lecture and to our first speaker, Stephen Fletcher. Steve is an executive vice president of Skinner Inc. and the director of its Americana department, focusing on American furniture, decorative arts, and folk art. He is Skinner's chief auctioneer and appraiser and a source of knowledge on early American life. You may have seen him on Antiques Roadshow on which he has been a frequent and popular appraiser. Steve's official bio, when I went to look at it this week to write this uh, introduction says that he quote, eagerly lends his expertise to the media, museums, historical societies and nonprofit institutions. And I can confirm that he sure does, because he has been a gracious, valuable, and enthusiastic contributor to this series. Um, and we're, he came to us last spring first to look at what we had and think about what pieces he might want to talk about. He then came back earlier this month to film some video, which will be part of this lecture. And now he has come back today for the lecture. We're grateful for all of his attention and hard work. And in a minute, I'll be turning things over to Steve Fletcher. But first, speaking of video, um, I wanted to give a few quick words about how this lecture will work. Um, we are going hybrid in two different ways. First, some of you are at home and some of you are here in the Gillis Reading Room at the Hingham Heritage Museum. But second, some of this video, this lecture will be happening live here in the reading room and some will be played on video for the very simple reason that we couldn't move the three glorious pieces of furniture that Steve's going to talk about up to the third floor for this lecture. So we filmed Steve examining the pieces down in our Kelly gallery and you'll be watching those parts on video. So for each of the three pieces, I am going to first offer some very assured information about uh, the connection of the pieces to Hingham homes or Hingham families. And then Steve will talk about the pieces, both live and on video, 
And we will have questions about all three segments, all three pieces of furniture at the end. So a lot of moving parts, um, and you can now see why we are so grateful to Colin, Eileen, and Deirdre for figuring out how to make it all work. And we just have to hope that I am able to push all the right buttons at the right time. So the first piece of furniture that uh, Steve is going to talk to us about um, is uh, the Martin Gay desk or old Tory. And this is an immense and wonderful piece of furniture that was donated to the society in 2014 by Ebenezer and Diana Gay. The desk descended in the Gay family from its original owner, Martin Gay, who was one of the sons of Ebenezer Gay, the pastor of Hingham's first parish for most of the 18th century. Martin Gay was a merchant and he lived on Union Street in Boston, near what's today the Paniel Hall Marketplace. And he was a loyalist. And so the desk's nickname, Old Tory, is a nod to his political leanings. His second wife was a woman named Ruth Atkins Gay, and the desk was made by Ruth's brother, Boston cabinet maker Gibbs Atkins, um, at the time of Martin's marriage to Ruth in 1765. For such a big piece of furniture, the desk is very well traveled. Martin left Boston with the British evacuation in 1776, and he took the desk with him to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and later took it to London, where he went to prosecute his claims for compensation with the British Crown. Martin was a deacon of West Church in Boston on Cambridge Street, and it is told that he took the communion silver and linens from West Church with him in the desk to Halifax, to London, and then brought them back to Boston in 1792. Frances Gay Winslow, Martin's daughter, inherited the desk. She was married to Isaac Winslow, another Boston merchant, and Frances, or Fanny, brought the desk to 89 North Street when she was widowed in the early uh, 19th century. She left the desk to her grandson, Sidney Howard Day, Sidney Howard Gay, uh, a well-known uh, abolitionist journalist uh, who lived in New York and he moved the desk down to his Statlin Island home. The desk then moved back several times between Boston and New York in various branches of the Gay family until Eben Gay purchased it um, in the mid 20th century. And uh, then it and then on it stayed in his North Street home. So that's the story that we have from, from Eben Gay uh, about the uh, para, peripatetic uh, desk. And uh, now we'll hear from Steve about it. First of all, I, I'm honored to be here, to say the least. This, uh, um, I've been to a lot of historical societies, but this one's at the top. It's, it's a wonderful facility with dedicated people in a community that has um, incredible... You lie first, I was just trying to queue it up. Okay, that's good. It's, it's, actually, I interrupt myself a lot, so. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, um, I'm very happy to be here and be part of the program and had the distinct pleasure and rare opportunity to look at this piece of furniture. How's that? That's great. Okay. Go to the tape, that's what you say. <laughs> Perfect. All right, I'm here to discuss um, truly, without hyperbole, can be called uh, an American masterpiece. This is an extraordinary desk bookcase with a very interesting history, to say the least. So what we're going to do is look at it in detail from top to bottom, and I'll give you some observations as to why all the elements that we'll be pointing out add up to what is truly 
uh, one of the great pieces of American furniture that uh, somehow has survived since uh, 1775 or 6. So let's, let's begin at the top, shall we? So uh, the cresting of this piece centers a gilded phoenix bird. And we've got this scrolled cresting with gadroon carved outer edge, molded inner edge that ends in these what were originally applied floral rosettes. They're long gone uh, for whatever reason we don't know. And uh, that decoration might have continued to some sort of carved garland beneath that in the opening. Um, the top is flanked by these uh, beautifully turned and carved urn and uh, flame finials. As we continue down, it's a very architectural piece. You'll see these same details on a magnificent mansion of the period, for example. But this gadroon carving and then the dental detail, all right, immediately above the doors. Uh, the doors are flanked by these beautifully carved Corinthian capitals and then fluted pilasters that extend to molded plinths. Uh, the doors are mirrored, obviously, with this gilt and sized border. High drama, it's very dramatic to look at. And it is, it's believed that the mirrored tablets are, are original. Now, we open these to, to reveal a complex, very useful interior. So the interior, uh, the back of the case is uh, eastern white pine, but interestingly enough, the mirrors are backed with cedar, which would have been a local wood. Uh, this is practical and beautiful. These dividers for books or ledgers can be moved to accommodate a thin or a larger book. Um, this cock beating is, is a beautiful detail that makes it all the more impressive to look at. All of these drawers are functional, single drawers. And this, this one, this is a very New England thing. We could look inside and in this little box, if we can get it open here. That Mr. Gay wrote spare parts. <laughs> I love this. I see this over and over when I look at old furniture on calls. But these are little bits and pieces of actually part of the dental detail they saved. But they were saved in a box when the piece was um, restored, I guess, in 1976. And there's a couple of original glue blocks in the drawer. Um, when in doubt, keep them, right? Um, and for the sake of just uh, keeping this uh, detailed and complex, this drawer is faux divided into two drawers. So there's a false divider there. Pleasing to look at. All right. Now you might say, what are these? Well, these are candle slides. So you had to see what you were writing. So one would place a candle at the appropriate hour on both sides to help light your work. And this actually is an 18th century candle. It's very appropriate they have this. So these push out of sight, out of the way when you're not using them. Let's, let's dwell just a moment on this magnificent piece of mahogany. Uh, this mahogany was grown in rainforests and harvested in the 18th century. It was a very, very valuable commodity. Um, these trees and, and the green that you see here is glorious. As a result, the tree is growing um, very slowly in the middle of a, a, a rainforest so that uh, it's dense, beautiful wood. Uh, mahogany today is grown under ideal circumstances, quick, it's easy, and it's not the same thing. So this wood of, wood of this quality is at this point all but um, extinct. I imagine there's some still down there somewhere. Um, but at the time, it was uh, harvested in tremendous quantities. So we open the lid, which probably weighs 15 pounds, one piece of wood. Uh, the support system for the lid are these candle slides. And we might note that just the facings of the, uh, not candle slides, but the drawer supports are faced with mahogany. So they didn't use the wood unless it was really necessary. Uh, so secondary wood, eastern white pine all over the place. 
But look at this interior. It is spectacular. Um, whoever ordered this desk up, Martin Gay said, I want everything, and, and he got it. So again, we could start at the middle. This is called a prospect door. It has a concave carved panel and this beautifully detailed fan. And uh, this isn't quite as simple as it seems. There is a valance drawer here. Again, all dovetail constructed. Uh, and you can pull out this whole section, all right? And this reveals a very neatly constructed box. All dovetail construction, again, eastern white pine, but when you turn it around, there are two secret drawers that are accessed with little leather straps, which are original. So very precious documents, things they didn't want people to see would have been hidden away there successfully. And curiously enough, on this you will see, so we can turn this, you see there's a chalk drawing which is a rough representation of what we see at the top of the desk bookcase, the sc scrolled cresting. Very interesting detail that you might not see unless you took out the, this section. So now everybody knows about the, the secret drawers. I've spilled the beans, I guess, haven't I? We also might mention that these flame and urn finials here, half finials on these engaged half columns, they basically call reference to what we see in the top, those beautiful finials. So the prospect door, that whole box is flanked by these valance drawers, which have been concave carved, makes them very easy to pull in and out. Uh, these drawers are convex and concave fronted with blocked ends. All these details cost extra money. Um, then the flanking fans above these two concave carved block drawers um, add to a richness and beauty. And the thing that I find so satisfying about this furniture is that it's, it's um, symmetrical, it's architectural, it makes you feel good. Just looking at this you have to feel like this balance in life because it's represented in this masterpiece. The case itself um, is what they call a Bombay. Uh, case and Bombay refers to the shaping of the front of the drawers and in this case this was even more an expensive uh, project in that they have to shape the sides of the case. So that took an immense amount of mahogany. Uh, the mahogany board would have had to be very thick. They couldn't bend it. They had to shape it and cut it out. So there was an incredible use of lumber here. Um, and we can show you the construction of the drawer. This is, this is about the only thing that's been done to this interior. This drawer has a replaced drawer bottom. Doesn't affect the value. And if we look at the brass, this is original handmade brass, remarkably still there. And if you look inside the drawer, for example, um, these, the hardware inside is obviously all handmade with these little nuts, very reassuring. Draw fronts of mahogany. Again, we see eastern white pine. We see dovetail construction on the sides. And this is yet another example. We see this often in Massachusetts furniture. They double bead the top edge. For what reason? I'm not sure. It's just it's pleasing to look at. And yet another um, case of quality, very much in evidence. And you might also note that this case the, the case is uh, what they call cock beaded. Nice detail, the inside, outside edge, and it is repeated around the drawer support slides and the drawers. It's durable. Um, if we move slightly up the lid, this is called uh, thumb molding. The thumb molding, it can be subject to, uh, subject to damage. And you can see here, for example, there is some damage on the edge. But they avoided that problem by um, not having thumb molded uh, uh, detail in the base. And you can see this probably was forced open at some point. I don't know if you can see that. And there's also evidence that somebody forced their way into the desk. There's a patch here. 
So the complexity, difficulty, and, and skill of making a Bombay base for a desk um, and having it turn out just perfectly balanced is a remarkable work. Um, Gibbs Atkins was a very skilled cabinet maker who employed the latest techniques and very successfully created a desk that was cutting edge and of extraordinary quality. There is a desk that is very similar to this piece in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and that too has a, has a secure attribution and a history. Uh, moving on down now, if we look at, the, at this desk, and this weighs a tremendous amount. Um, so these are called OG bracket feet, and they're beautifully shaped. And this whole uh, shaping of the sides, this OG shape, if you will, it's repeated in the base. This isn't just a happenstance. It was all very, very carefully planned. And they've even shaped the pendant in the bottom of the case. It has a rounded front which conforms with the shaping of the leg and also is satisfying continuing uh, the beautiful uh, profile that the desk has. Uh, the desk um, was cleaned, I think, in 1976. So they, I think, cleaned it with denatured alcohol. And in doing so, um, a lot of the color um, that was there, we're talking about centuries worth of exposure to smoke, you see that it's, it still um, survives inside. It has a deeper color. Uh, but I think in doing that, they wanted to restore the desk to its original spectacular uh, appearance. And they succeeded in doing that. There are purists who say, well, we we would have preferred seeing the old surface. Well, we weren't there. We don't know what the old surface was like. It could have been extremely dark, and it might well have obscured this fantastic mahogany. Uh, this, at some point, was regilded very well, I must say, as was the Phoenix Bird. So it's remarkable that this desk somehow, through its checkered and very interesting history, um, old Tory, as they called it, um, survived to this day and is now in uh, the Hingham Historical Society. Uh, they are fortunate, I think, to have in their possession um, a piece of furniture, the likes of which um, uh, I will rarely ever see. So as far as the piece of furniture that you all just saw, does anyone have any, have any questions as to uh, something I might have missed along the way? I'm happy to answer those questions. Um, I was thinking, I was thinking uh, that this this piece of furniture, which was a gift by by uh, the cabinet makers, uh, given to his sister on the occasion of her marriage. All I can think of is that these days people uh, they have uh, you know wedding uh, registers, so they register for stemware or silverware. Can you imagine getting this as a wedding gift? I mean it. Definitely beats a toaster oven, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and I, I, I think the piece is, is such a masterpiece. It, it's as if you said to Leonardo, do another Mona Lisa. Or, uh, you know, pitch another no hitter. How about two in a row? That kind of thing. If this is the only piece of furniture he ever made in his career, um, I think it's, it would be, he would be remembered for that alone. But the fact is that he was a successful cabinet maker. There's another example of his work, as we mentioned, the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, so this is totally, sometimes people, furniture, is that art? If that isn't art, I don't know what is. It's extraordinary. Yeah, thank you. So uh, other work attributed to him that you know? Say again? There are. Well, the Museum of Fine Arts piece, for example, and there are others. I mean, he's, he's not exactly, I think, most people interested in early American furniture. And quite frankly, he's not that familiar a name to a lot of people, which surprises me because he produced this. I mean, a lot of people don't know a great deal of thing about antiques. We think our table was made by Duncan Fife. I've heard that so many times. Or uh, people will say to me this, this came over on the Mayflower, and I always add in quickly, if I feel it's safe territory, van lines. <laughs> <laughs> yes? A question about the range of talent that this might have, and another thing that just came to mind is, uh, 
what would the, the problem with the lock having been broken at some point? Would that affect the value of the lock? Um, the, the shortcomings of the piece are so minor. For instance, at the just above the lid, there's a small patch there that's totally acceptable, and the losses to the thumb molding on the top. I think they chose just to leave it alone. Um, it did have, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, it had carved rosettes in the in, in the scrolled cresting and probably some sort of floral garland, which is gone. Now, some might argue that there are other pieces that you could use as a template to restore that. I think the decision was made. No, let's just leave it alone. Um, uh, as, as far as the value is concerned, this is an extraordinary rarity. And I know when Gary Sullivan did the appraisal, he had to find comps, not the easiest thing to do. Um, you, you just don't like look one up. So there were some comps, uh, I think pieces of uh, equal rarity, significance, beauty, uh, quality were compared to this piece. And uh, so coming up with a number, um, wasn't the easiest thing in the world. Should we talk about its value? Yeah, I think so. No, look, so it's, it's really valuable. We'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I might say in general, uh, this market, which is characterized currently by ups and downs all over the place, because there's a whole, uh, it's as if a whole generation is gonna miss the, the joy of collecting. It just seems to have passed by them. And I think it has a matter of how people are educated today. And uh, I know the Boston University years ago, my, my business partner, Karen Keene, took a course with John Kirk of Boston University about American furniture. Extraordinary uh, uh, presentation, wonderful teacher. I think in some areas that's missing. If you want to be a, a winter tour uh, fellow, that sort of thing, go to some of their programs. And there are great programs out there available. But I think a lot of folks, uh, uh, they stop in at Ikea rather than take an interest in early American furniture. Um, it'll change. It's cyclical. It will come around. Um, I don't think I'll be selling uh, the furniture of these other decorative arts when it comes around again. But we've already seen subtle signs that um, it's, it's changing and young people are beginning to notice. Should we take one more? Okay. Good question. Thank goodness it's in two pieces. <laughs> um, and moving this, I, I don't know if anyone's ever weighed it, but it is exceedingly heavy because this wood is so dense. And if you think about it, there's a tremendous amount of lumber. If, so this was, this was made for someone who um, did not put the cabinet maker on a budget. <laughs> he said, do what you can do. Okay. Don't mean to cut off questions, but why don't we'll hold them to the end, I think, because then we can both mic you all up so that the people at home can hear you, you know, with a roving mic, and also so that the people at home can have a chance to have their questions as well. Um, and if people at home have their questions, you can put them in the in the chat box, Q and A box, in the box in the box for out of the box. So this, the second piece um, that, uh, oh, I just have one more anecdote about Martin Gay when we were talking about moving that big desk around, two pieces. Uh, the reason he was able to get it to Halifax and London, et cetera, so easily is he took it on his own ship, which was one of the benefits of being a merchant. Um, so that's how it got to move around so much. So, the next piece that we're gonna look at and talk about with Steve um, is a high chest um, and the name Susan Barker Willard is familiar to those of you who've spent any amount of time with the Hingham Historical Society. Uh, she was not only a founder of the society but was one of its early major benefactors. And Miss Willard, was descended from three prominent Hingham families, the Thaxters, the Barkers, and the Southers, and one prominent Deerfield family, the Willards. And at her death, she lived in her grandfather, Henry Thaxter's home called Tranquility Lodge, which still stands at 137 Main Street. 
She also owned and furnished with period pieces an adjacent 17th century cottage, which she called Roseneath. When Ms. Willard died in 1926, she bequeathed Roseneath Cottage and its contents, as well as other furnishings and artworks from Tranquility Lodge to the Hingham Historical Society. Um, and the high chest that Steve will be talking about was part of her bequest to the society. Much of what Miss Willard gave the society was used to furnish the old ordinary, which Wilman Brewer had purchased and donated to the society only a few years prior to Ms. Willard's death. And as it turned out, the old ordinary had once been the home of Francis Barker, Ms. Willard's great, great grandfather. The high chest was in the old ordinary from 1926 until 2017. Uh, when it was moved into the Kelly Gallery downstairs. And just as a note, so you all know, the Kelly Gallery will be open after uh, the lecture uh, so that you can all look at all three pieces of furniture. So this chest that we're going to see undoubtedly belonged to one of the families from whom Ms. Willard was descended because almost everything she gave us was a family uh, heirloom. And we don't know for certain, but it seems highly likely that it came from the Thaxters. This is not only because she inherited one of the Thaxter family homes, Tranquility Lodge, but also because during the early and mid 18th centuries, when that chest would have been new that we're going to see, the Thaxters were arguably the most affluent family in Hingham. Susan Barker Willard's great-great-grandfather, Major Samuel Thaxter, and two generations of Samuel Thaxters before him, lived in what is sometimes referred to as the Thaxter Mansion on North Street, which was located where St. Paul Church is now. Uh, and based on accounts and other artifacts we have, um, it appears that that house was decorated and furnished in a fairly lavish manner by the Tha Thaxter family. The Thaxters were politically and socially prominent. John Thaxter, who was 1755 to 1791, was for a while John Adams's private secretary and was the tutor for John Quincy Adams when he was growing up. And Elizabeth Thaxter Lincoln was Major General Benjamin Lincoln's mother. So a lot of Hingham history um, and uh, uh, a little peek into uh, another family of means uh, with Hingham connections. So while Paula's queuing that up, I was thinking if we were to have to evacuate these days, I, you wouldn't take a desk bookcase, you'd take your laptop. <laughs> My goodness, things have changed. Um, so this William and Mary or Queen Anne, uh, a high chest of drawers is an important part of the collection here in, in Hingham. This has an interesting local history. And also, uh, what's happened to it over the years tells us something and, and maybe uh, causes us to wonder why um, it underwent some changes. And that's something perhaps we'll never know. But this is constructed essentially of, uh, here we go again, eastern white pine. The sides of the high chest are veneered in vigorously patterned tiger maple, as was the base. Uh, these drawers are surrounded by a single arch molding, and it gives, it gives the front of the case a definition. It's interesting to look at. Um, and they've used very carefully matched burl veneers. You can see that the veneer, the pattern is split right down the middle. It's the same thing. Again, it's this whole symmetrical approach to furniture design. Um, which is evident through uh, you know, centuries, really. Uh, now we could take a drawer out, and the drawer facing, as I mentioned, is this matched burl veneer, and that's du double walnut herringbone border, very typical of this period. But it's, it's like putting a picture frame on a beautiful painting. Um, I think if this veneer went to the edge of the drawer, it just wouldn't be so pleasing to see. So, Perfect framing of that beautiful pattern. And it would appear, I believe, that the brasses, these are all handmade teardrop brasses, as well as the, the escutcheon for the keyhole, 
I believe that they are original. Um, if you look inside, they've been moved at some point when the piece was refinished and then put back in. These are almost like little staples that are wired back and then pushed into the very soft surface of the white pine. We also might look at the inside of the lock. Totally handmade, and these are all handmade nails, so untouched. Oftentimes the locks are long gone, they're here. And typically with this, with this period you have relatively thin draw sides, which would be more in the British tradition. Uh, as furniture was made later into the 18th century, the draw sides get thicker. Uh, and be beautiful dovetailed detail. You can see it here in the front edge. You can see it on the back. And it could be that they, they may have put an additional patch on the bottom of the drawer. White pine is soft, it wears, and they wanted the drawers to continue to work smoothly. We also might note that these early handmade nails, there's evidence of oxidation and that takes a long, long time. And you can see this like hand-cut nail. It's very clear here. So the drawer runs in these thin strips rather than on the bottom of the drawer itself. That's why we don't see anything, any particular wear. The only thing I can feel when I run my hand across it is that it's all hand-planed. So we look at the top. Everything, everything looks, looks as it should, with a possible exception, some of these Single arch moldings we talked about, some pieces may have been replaced at some point because they're nailed on and they come off rather easily. Now if we look at the base, um, I know when I first saw it I thought the draw fronts, the veneer, it's just a little different color, it's lighter. All right. So sometimes that can be the fact that maybe it was exposed to more sunlight and in fact sometimes these pieces were separated and you'll find some examples where they've actually put feet on the top, used the top in the bedroom and used the base as a sideboard or in a dining room as a dressing table. So let's take, I might add here that this, this is solid walnut, this very deep um, streamlined mid molding which appears to be original. But then we open a drawer and what do we see? These drawers are obviously made in the early 20th century. And several things are evident immediately. This drawer is not dovetailed as the top drawers. The drawer sides are thicker. Um, the drawer bottoms are cut with circular, circular saws. They're not chamfered, if you will, into the bottom. Uh, and there's very little evidence of wear here. Um, this was stained to make it look old. So they went to some trouble and I'm not going to knock their efforts because they did a, a very good job indeed of finding beautiful veneer for the facing and the double herringbone uh, border. Uh, another thing we noted is that the brass teardrop pulls in the bottom drawers are just a little bit bigger in scale. Um, the ones in the top show more evidence of wear. So I don't know whether the, this, this is a legitimate restoration. They could have done a better job, but the, the effect totally from the exterior is just fine. And if we look, we do a side-by-side -side comparison here, you can, you can see the difference. Thinner sides here, okay, dovetailing, absent, drawer bottoms, very different indeed. So. Um, it's just, it's a part of its history. So the thing I find very pleasing about this high chest, it's, uh, it's beautifully proportioned, it's small. Um, it's the sort of piece that doesn't completely dominate a room. The magnificent desk and bookcase we looked at earlier, that's the star of the show. You just can't put that in any room. It requires a very special space. And I must say the space it occupies now is special indeed. This is small. So they put it in this niche. It looks great here. Um, it was refinished years ago. As I mentioned, they replaced the, the brasses in the base, as were the drawers, and the painted detail on the legs, which is sort of a spotted brown paint. I'm not sure what the effect was supposed to be, but it probably is uh, reminiscent of what may have been there originally. 
So all in all, um, a lovely addition to the, the Historical Society's collection. So we thought we'd take a look at the base of this piece. Uh, the, the, this high chest, uh, because it's supported, uh, this case is very heavy, it's supported by a base that is in some ways rather fragile and subject to lots of uh, damage and oftentimes replaced. Uh, so we turned it over to take a good look at it and it does show evidence of some work, but frankly it looked a little bit better than I might have anticipated. In this case, um, these shaped flat stretchers are eastern white pine and they, they display a good deal of oxidation and color. There, there have been uh, repairs which I find uh, reassuring because that's what one might think. Um, the feet and then the legs are turned maple and at some point they look as though somebody has painted them to make them resemble well bird's eye maple or some sort of exotic wood. They almost look like tortoise. Not sure what their intention was. Maybe they weren't either. Uh, and the legs are supported on these platforms and the front edge of this shaped valance skirt, it has an applied beading. Um, this, is, this has been applied to the case and there are very, evidence of very early nails here. Um, so that's original. If we look more inside the, the piece itself, um, the drawer runners have been replaced. They would appear to be probably early 20th century. Um, white pine is a soft wood. And oftentimes the drawer runners will wear down to such an extent that the drawers don't work very well, and that's probably why they did that. So there were other few minor things done here, um, but by and large, um, I was surprised that this actually looked perhaps a little bit better than I thought it might have examining it carefully. If we look at the side of the case here, um, the sides, rather than use solid tiger maple, they veneered it with tiger maple rather than just having the eastern white pine uh, be what you what you see. Also, it might add the turnings in the legs. They're a little out of round, and each one is slightly different than the other one. I mean, it's not something that is like really evident, but we looked at the diameter, for instance, around this central part of the turning, and this one, this, this is somewhat larger than this, uh, but the piece when put together, it's something that one wouldn't notice one way or another. The backboard of the piece here, if you, if you want to take a look at that, shows a great deal of oxidation. Uh, this was exposed to the elements, and if we look at the back of it, same story. A um, lot of color, and if you can zero in somehow, the sides and the back are dovetailed. So that helped, helped the piece uh, stay in, in one piece, if I can say that, rather than um, you know, being uh, uh, subject to more wear and tear. Talk a little bit about this early high chest. I think someone might be thinking, um, what's, what significance is the restoration that I pointed out in our inspection have, for instance, on its value? Um, considerable. Uh, the beauty of the desk and bookcase is that it was largely untouched. That makes a difference. Um, this piece, because the drawers have been replaced and there have been some other alterations to the base, albeit done very, very well, does affect its value. Um, it doesn't affect its historical significance and it's a part uh, in the history of the town of Hingham. And who knows what happened along the way? Um, who can surmise what happened to the drawers? I mean, maybe in a move they were left behind, we'll, we'll never really know. But family thought enough of this piece to hire a capable cabinet maker who did a wonderful job matching the veneer. Uh, the only thing they might have done is maybe uh, dovetailed the drawers, but the construction itself, unless you inspect it like me, for example, you don't notice it at all. Okay, so now I'll say a few words about the third um, piece of 18th century furniture that we're going to look at, a, a very different one. Um, and as I say, uh, hold your questions about the high chest until the end, and we will uh, 
take both direct and virtual questions then. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the third piece, also down in the Kelly Gallery, um, is a dressing, 18th century dressing table and two 19th century chairs um, that were, came to the society in 1986 as a bequest of Mary McKay Luce in memory of her late husband, Stuart Blake Luce. Stuart Blake Luce and his father, William Blake Luce, were among other things, members of the Arts and Crafts Society of Hingham in the early part of the 20th century. Hingham was home to an early and influential Arts and Crafts Society between 1901 and the beginning of World War I. One of its founders was the indefatigable Susan Barker Willard, who, ran everything in town, so far as I can tell. And um, she was in no doubt, she was no doubt inspired by the early example of the Arts and Crafts Society of Deerfield, the town where she was born and had many relatives. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century, a number of artists, artisans, and other creatives moved to Hingham. Um, at least in part because of its growing reputation in the arts and crafts movement. These included, for instance, W. Addison Dwiggins, Frederick and Bertha Gowdy, Beatrice and Louis Ryle, and William Blake Luce, who was an illustrator, photographer, inventor, and artisan from Boston. Luce opened a photography studio in Hingham and also started making wooden toys, doll houses, and doll furniture around 1910, opening a shop with his son, Stuart Blake Luce. So the family which owned the dressing table, which Steve is going to talk about, has an interesting history of attention paid to the decorative arts. This does not unfortunately, however, tell us who uh, did the work on uh, the dressing table that we're going to see or paired it with a lovely set of 19th century chairs. So this, this is a lovely dressing table. Um, and it's interesting the term low boy or high boy are terms that I think they came along in the early 20th century. And some of the terminology is changing to uh, mirror what this would have been called when it was made and that would be a, a dressing table. Uh, so this, this piece was made probably sometime around 17, let's say 30 to 50. Um, you might say, well, it doesn't look like it. Um, that's because probably in 1840 or 50, they gilded it and painted it with uh, designs that would have been reminiscent and very much in vogue in that period. A lot of you perhaps have seen English uh, paper mache items, trays, uh, beautiful serving trays, boxes and so on that are painted in a similar manner. Um, whoever did the decorating, this wasn't a, this wasn't a casual effort. Um, this is done by someone who probably uh, their trade was decorating furniture because it's beautifully done. Now you might say, does this hurt the value? Yes and no. Um, I rather like it because this shows these people want to keep this piece up to date. And that's what they did. But curiously enough, if you look at the case, and this drawer arrangement is a little unusual. Um, you've got two half drawers and three third drawers here. These drawers are, are they painted all surfaces, inside, sides. The only thing they're left alone are the bottoms, which again are eastern white pine with lots of wear. So we know right away that these drawers are original, okay? And the case as it was in the desk bookcase, um, this cock beading surrounds the drawers, adds a nice dimension. And on the sides is the, is the double cock beading. And they made this even more evident by painting it gold, okay? So these turned poles were probably put on in 1840 and 50 when the piece was painted. Um, but interestingly enough, if you look at this in uh, 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 raking light, for example, um, I notice that the drawer fronts are veneered as they were in the high chest we looked at before. They're veneered with some sort of figured wood. You can't see much of it. But again, herringbone 
uh, inlay borders. So what they did was they modernized the piece, brought it up to date, um, and sent it off to somebody who was uh, very proficient at, at doing so. It would appear that the legs are walnut. Uh, this is a cabrio leg with kind of a nice sharp knee that continues down to this pad foot. And this, this valanced skirt here is re very reminiscent of Massachusetts furniture of that period in the 18th century. These little acorn drop pendants, tough to tell if they're original, but they, they look almost a bit too small. Um, the square patch on which they are glued, some of that is original. You can see it's repaired. The one thing that we did notice is that I think the top is in question. The top has to have been on this uh, dressing table since the paint job was added, and that could have been in the 1840s or 50s. But it's one solid piece of walnut with sort of this just curved edge which extends in all four corners. It's not what one would expect to see uh, in that period. And if you're going to go to the trouble of using burl, fancy veneer for the drawer fronts with herringbone borders, um, generally speaking, more often than not, they would go to the same trouble to decorate the top. So I think the top is an old replacement. We tried in vain to see how it's attached to the base. It appears to have been nailed. Originally, it would have been held in with wooden pegs or some glue blocks. No sign of any of that. So here's a piece of furniture that's had some restoration, um, but ultimately to a very pleasing effect. I think it was suggested years ago, oh, that you should refinish it and remove the paint. No, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. I think, it's, I think it's fascinating the way it is and very pleasing. So I guess we don't know whether this dressing table was painted in this beautiful manner to match the chairs or whether the chairs were painted to match the dressing table. I mean, these chairs are sort of uh, Rococo style. I think they date from the mid uh, 19th century, as does the paint on the dressing table. So they must have been used in the same room, that would be my guess. So when looking at an antique piece of furniture, um, it's like looking underneath the hood of a car. You want to find out why it's running like it is, or if it needs an oil change or something. With furniture, you go to look inside. And that tells you a lot about what may or may not have happened over the years. In this particular instance, um, we questioned the top. The top is walnut, and it is not veneered in the way that the drawer fronts are. Um, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I think we've determined the top probably in this piece had to have been on this piece since probably 1840 or 50 because the paint job is from that period. Uh, other than that, um, structurally, the legs, uh, the framing, it's all very good. And what we can see that wasn't painted black, you can see there's considerably more oxidation above the drawer runner than below because inside the case that white pine has pr been protected from the elements, smoke, dirt, whatever there may be. That's a very good thing and it's also evident here that as you look further out towards the edge there's more and more oxidation. So these are all good things that, that make sense to us and even the drawer runners have handmade nails and there's some oxidation there. Hard to know um, if these little acorn drop pendants are original. They look a little small, but on the other hand, they've been on there a very long time, and this little flat platform looks as though that one's been, or half of it has been replaced, but that's a good thing. That's what we want to see. Okay, um, so did I, did I uh, uh, interest anyone enough to ask me some questions about the three pieces of furniture that we've looked at? Together, yes. Um, we, can get, we can use the microphones because that allows the people at home to hear if that's okay. Um, I wanted to know the quality of the furniture, the wood. You mentioned at one point um, white pine was used in some some of those pieces of furniture. The pine seemed to be fairly soft. Other ones, earlier ones, would, would it be more dense wood? So your question is why they would use a soft wood as a secondary element? 
Um, it's. Uh, No, that, that's a good question. For instance, some very early furniture, you'll see pine used as a secondary wood, and it is more dense. So actually, a neighbor of mine showed me like a 19, uh, I think 1932 by four, and one that was from a lumber yard recently, and there's a distinct difference in the grain. Uh, the earlier piece of grain is much tighter. It's just much better lumber. I think that's one reason why houses today uh, that are built in recent decades um, deteriorate rather quickly. They need constant upkeep because the quality of the wood isn't it good and it's much more susceptible to the elements. You'll see other woods used in furniture as secondary wood. In other words, drawer sides or drawer bottoms. Uh, there are pilgrim century, 17th century pieces made in New England where the drawer sides are massive, thick pieces of oak, red oak usually. And sometimes they'll use, you know, they might use pine as a drawer bottom. You'll see 18th century furniture where chestnut is used as a secondary wood. And chestnut um, lasts, it doesn't wear. Um, but after a while, uh, as we know today, chestnut's not obtainable. Um, so that it's a good question. Uh, pine was durable, but we looked at a couple of those pieces and you could see that the bottom of the drawers, they actually had patched the bottom edge because they didn't work particularly well. And if some of you own antiques, um, you'll, there'll be some drawers, you gotta work with them. You know, they don't come out very smoothly. That sort of uh, restoration is, is probably a good idea. It's just a practical thing to do. Okay. Got any more questions here? Anyone out there? And um... we do have some questions. So there's one question for Paula. Uh, there's a question for Paula, if you can hear from this microphone, um, and that is about what happened to the cottage after it was donated, Roseneath Cottage. I think at some, some point in the late 40s, early 1950s, uh, the society uh, decided it could not maintain two, house, two houses. Um, it, it never opened Roseneath as a house museum. It rented it. Uh, it was a rental. I, the house is still there, and somebody lives in it. I don't know who, but um, they, they, the society sold it in the early 50s. And there's a question for Steve about the desk, the brass ornamentation on the side of the desk. And is that there's some brass ornamentation on the side of the gay desk? And, and the question was, was that normal? Yes, those on, on heavy pieces of walnut or mahogany furniture, um, especially if they're um, extraordinary pieces uh, such as this is, you will have those side handles to carry the base. Makes it easy to move, but I must admit, where I'm moving that, I wouldn't... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't use them. It makes me pretty nervous. But I think that, that, was, that was a practical move. And yet uh, another aspect of um, this piece being made with no budget in mind, um, I, I might add the, the uh, uh, Martin Gay desk and bookcase. The only other thing they might have done in this case is they might have ordered up, let's say, claw and ball feet that you see in the Chippendale period. But I think the choice, remember the OG bracket feet? I think that was an aesthetic choice. And as I pointed out in the presentation, it continues that beautiful form right to the bottom of the piece. So I would prefer that they uh, that the, it have OG bracket feet, even though a claw and ball foot might have been even a more expensive option. But it could well be that the cabinet maker said, I don't think we should do this. So I think, I think it was his decision to go with the OG bracket feet. Another question for you, Steve. Uh, this uh, viewer is saying, you seem to use the descriptions Queen Anne and William and Mary interchangeably. Could you tell us, are they terms that can be used interchangeably, a Queen Anne style and a William and Mary style? Are they interchangeable? Right, that, it, it's interesting if you 
If you look at uh, uh, research and reference books published in more recent years, they've been, they've been many cases, they abandoned using those terms, William and Mary, Queen Anne, Chippendale, uh, Sheridan. Uh, Chippendale, for example, refers to an English designer, uh, Sheridan as well. People say, well, I have, a, I, have a, I have a Sheridan chest of drawers. Well, if that were being described uh, that way, you might assume that it's of English origin. Um, now they would, in this country, call it classical or federal. Um, so those terms, Queen Anne, the Queen Anne period would be, let's say, from, uh, well, maybe 17. 40 to 60, somewhere in there. Chippendale period starts after that and goes into the very late 18th century. There are exceptions to that rule, however. Country cabinet makers often made so-called Queen Anne, Chippendale, federal furniture, sometimes considerably out of period because they were isolated to a certain extent and style changes just didn't come to them so quickly, communication being what it was. I remember our offering a Chippendale, uh, New Hampshire tall chest of drawers. And if you looked at it, you'd say, oh, that must have been made in 1780. It had original red paint on the back. It said in the same paint, made 1820. So this was made decades, a couple of decades at least later than we might have thought. So the, that description, Queen Anne, Chippendale, William and Mary, um, it, refers, uh, it refers to the English counterparts, if you will. So I think now furniture scholars have to some degree abandoned using, the, using those terms. There are these old fashioned terms like we, we have a, a Governor Winthrop desk. You see that in early 20th century reference books. Uh, you know, Governor Winthrop didn't own all these desks. He might own one. And the same thing holds, holds uh, true. Uh, we have a Martha Washington chair. Well, I know what they're talking about because you look at the, look at these early books and it may reference the fact that indeed Martha Washington might have had a, a lolling chair in the Chippendale period, but they've stopped associating these names with furniture styles because they're far too specific. Um, and as I think I mentioned earlier, um, a high boy. Well, everybody said, oh, we have a high boy and uh, or a low boy. Uh, those are terms that are 20th century concoctions and may have actually come along with the whole colonial revival interest in America. And as I'd say, those terms have been ab abandoned uh, by and large. A question from one of our very hardworking volunteers for the society, Ellen Miller, uh, thought she had heard earlier that some of the ornamentation on the top of Old to Tory came later. And you did talk about some or ornamentation that may have been there, rosettes, for example, maybe a garland that are no longer there. But it, uh, is it your thought that any of the ornamentation that is at the top of the desk now was added at a later period than when the desk was built? Um, no, I think what we see is original. There was some, there was some repair to that dental detail. And we saw, we saw the, <clears throat> the pieces of, uh, that were replaced or patched in that little box. Um, I mean, that recalls uh, other situations. This is, this is not uncommon in New England. I went on a call in Sudbury, Massachusetts, and they had a lot of very interesting early material. And we found this very neat box tied up with ribbon. I thought, what's in this? And inside was a carefully written note. And it said, um, pieces of unknown furniture. <laughs> so people, people save things. But as far as the ornamentation on the top of the desk bookcase, we'll never know how it was lost. And the decision to, uh, it may have happened during the, all the times it was moved, transported, because these were elements that were applied to the top, fragile. <clears throat> it could be that some of it was lost and they decided to remove the rest of it. But those, the, the scroll cresting, those would have been probably floral carved rosettes, okay? And uh, there's another piece where it shows a, like a floral garland on the, on the face of the cresting. Does that answer the question? I was just going to, I was just going to add that um, some people may have seen photographs of the old Tory without the finials and without the phoenix. And uh, in fact, um, Evan Gay explained that in his letter when it was sent to us that it didn't fit in the gay house with all of that on top because it was a, 
But they say early that. 18th century house with fairly low things, so they took them off. And so many of the photographs we have of the desk in Hingham, it doesn't have all of that on it, but they are otherwise original. So years ago, I, I um, was in Weston and this old farmhouse, and there was a gentleman who'd lived there, I think, all his life. And he said, well, we'll go out back. And the, you know, New England houses, early New England houses have oftentimes appendages connecting buildings and so on. So we go from the house through a hallway and then up a stairs. And I noticed to my right was an untouched Queen Anne, um, tiger maple high chest. And uh, it was cut off at the knees and embedded in the wall. And I blurted out, what? why would anyone do that? And he looked at me and said, because it wouldn't fit. <laughs> so people people thought nothing of making these changes because not in the case of the desk bookcase, but a lot of furniture out there has been compromised just for practical reasons. Uh, chairs lose height, they cut the legs off or else maybe they were stored improperly and, and there was rot at the bottom of the legs. And I, as I mentioned, oftentimes high chest, the top and the bottom are separated, used in, in different rooms. Um, yes. Um, I tend to think of very practical things. And um, so th these are all obviously works of art and works workmanship and all of that. But I, I, I wonder why they were originally created. Were they to be only works of art or were they to somehow symbolize the wealth that people might have because when I look at the tiny little drawers and so many of them uh, and the, in the desk, particularly when you open the doors and you see all of those little rounded places to put things, was there ever to be a practical value for people who tended to be much shorter in those days and perhaps not having many, uh, many little things to put away? What was the original intent of someone who would create um, something like that? I, I think a, a piece can be simultaneously a work of art and a, and a practical piece of furniture. Uh, that this bookcase, I'm sure, had a tremendous amount of use. Um, and by virtue of what we see in the interior with all those compartments with the movable dividers, drawers that contain a variety of things, that desk in its own way is as elaborate and as expensive and extraordinary that it is, um, served a very important function uh, in, the, in the household. It was, I imagine the drawers were full of things. Um, so it can be simultaneously a work of art and practical. Country furniture tends to be less ostentatious, obviously, but these things are all made uh, to be used. They also, in the case of these very sophisticated city pieces of furniture made by urban cabinet makers. Um, people had money, they, sh they wanted to show off. So there was this, there was this competitive world of um, having extraordinary furniture made by fine cabinet makers um, because basically they were trying to keep up with their contemporaries and make it very, very evident that we've, we've made a lot of money, we have good taste, we want the very best. The same thing holds true for architecture. We'll see these fantastic houses with extraordinary architectural detail. Um, doesn't mean the house wasn't livable or practical. It just was uh, very beautiful. A question about the painting uh, on, on like the third piece, right. the, oh boy. Um, I had the feeling you were mentioning at some point, perhaps that could have been removed or replaced. Does the painting ever add value to furniture of this quality? And I wonder about the content of this. Some of the gold painting actually contain gold and have value in that as well. No, that's actually, it's a, that's a good question in regards to this dressing table because the, a lot of furniture, particularly country furniture, was painted right from the get-go. So we talk about pieces, it's got the original old red paint, or you'll see Windsor chairs. Well, most Windsor chairs that we see, and in, 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 in American Windsor chairs, in my mind's eye, are far more successful than their English counterparts. They're extraordinary. Um, but those chairs were all painted. They were painted green, uh, there are, are, oftentimes they look black, but green paint turns very dark over time. In the case of Windsor chairs, they might be made out of maple, ash, chestnut, pine. I mean, various elements like the bow might be 
ash. It's it's easily manipulated. So the last thing I want, wanted you to see was we used three different kinds of wood to make the chairs. So they painted it. In the case of this dressing table, it would have looked much like the high chest before they painted it. Uh, so I think it was an attempt to make it look current and stylish, more to, in the sort of Rococo revival, if you will, style. Does that hurt the value of this? I think the dressing table came across on tape really looking very beautiful. We might have gotten a little better shot at the top because the top in itself, you could hang it on the wall. It's, it's a lovely still life. If you go to the Kelly Gall Gallery, you'll see that. Um, so we've sold 18th century chairs that will have early 19th century uh, painted decoration. I remember selling um, a Windsor chair that at some point had been repainted well, we'll start here. We sold a, a pair of fanback Windsor chairs that were probably Salem, Massachusetts, that had been repainted two times at least. But the, the third time or second time they'd been painted, um, they had put yellow and green pinstriping on the elements to accentuate turnings on the legs, for example, or on the bows or spindles. Oh my God, it was so beautiful. And the background, the, the yellow and green pinstriping was was uh, sort of red uh, and black. And it, they, I think they were attempting to make this chair look like rosewood. Okay, that was done, let's say in 1830 or 40. Well, a lot of that had worn away. Now you could see the original green paint. These were incredible. So this whole chair talked of its complete history. Uh, and that combination of painted uh, surfaces, if you will, wearing down, you know, uh, made a tremendous difference for these chairs. And I think at the time they brought 40, I think $40,000. So they were repainted. Did it hurt the chairs? In this case, it didn't hurt them at all. It only made them more beautiful. Repainting things uh, can really affect the value, particularly if they've been repainted in recent times, obviously. But some of these uh, 19th century updates, if you will, I find them uh, fascinating. And oftentimes uh, they can make the piece more interesting and in some cases more valuable. So Steve, you, what you just said partly answers this question that we got from a Zoom viewer. What treatments or changes to a piece of furniture reduce its value? I'm sure it's very subjective and individual to a piece, but are there some general rules that, that you might suggest to people if you have a, a beautiful, uh, heirloom piece of furniture, don't do this. You know, he's asking what changes in particular would reduce the value? Well, if, if some of you, for example, if you watch Antiques Roadshow, it's interesting, I oftentimes ask people, if, if you've learned anything from the show, what would it be? And people invariably say, don't refinish it. Um, so the desk bookcase, at some point, they took the early surface off because it probably was extremely dark. And we talked about it may, it may have obscured the, the mahogany. There are purists who don't care how dirty it is. Um, they like it left alone. Uh, there could be situations where you can take an original uh, surface and have it cleaned by a professional without removing the patina. But if, uh, you know, for, for many decades, people would take furniture to a uh, place where they, they would dip it in lye which is just, it's deadly, it really is. I can recall talking to a dealer years ago who went to a cabinet maker and he had a big lye dip tank and sitting next to the tank was a Queen Anne, Massachusetts dressing table, untouched with original red painted surface. And uh, this dealer who now is deceased said to the guy that was, he said, uh, what, what, are you, what are you gonna do with that? He said, well, like, we're going to take the paint off, but they want it refinished. He said, listen, he said, I'll make it worth your while to not do this. He said, this, this shouldn't happen. This is a great untouched piece of New England furniture. Um, can you tell me who owns it? He said, I'm not at liberty to do that. He said, well, he said, I could pay you handsomely to see that we could prevent this from happening. No dice. So Ray went back maybe a month later and by happenstance, here was the dressing table, you know, bright as can be, this bright maple with a wonderful shine on it. And he said, it's all I could do to not feel ill. <laughs> so so it's kind of a long answer to your question, but there are various things that can affect the value of, let's say, furniture. If you have a high boy and the legs are replaced, 
that's a big hurt. Um, if the top doesn't go with the bottom, and I always said a little ironic that they called those married high boys, whatever. Um, but there can be my, there can be minor re restorations, like if the brasses are replaced, they'd prefer the original. Um, but if they've been been replaced appropriately, okay. Um, some sort of technical replacements, like repairing draw sides so they run better. That, that's that's cool too. But the more restoration the better effect it, it has uh, on the, on, on the uh, I should say, the worse effect it has on the value. We offered years ago a Japan Queen Anne high chest that was untouched. Um, it, was, it was missing a lot of the decorative elements, but made in Boston probably about 17, 20 or 30. But it's one of, I think, four or five known pieces of Japan furniture that hasn't been restored. And I think at the time it brought, uh, I think almost $2 million. Um, it's very, very exciting. Uh, when I saw that, I thought, this is it. It can't get any better than this, but I don't know. I've seen this piece and hang them, so I'm not too sure about that. One more question from a Zoom viewer. And that is about, uh, you weren't wearing gloves when you took the drawers out of the various pieces of furniture. Um, is, is that something that is up to the the appraiser, uh, how, how do you handle wooden furniture best? Yeah, I tend to think if, if, if you're handling paper, um, things that can be affected by just the, the oil in your fingertips, um, uh, it's, it's good to wear gloves. When people look at antique firearms, they wear gloves. Um, if they even dare touch an antique coin, they're wearing gloves. Um, so if whatever is on your hands could affect the piece in a negative, negative way, um, um, I, I would recommend that. I mean, the the joy in looking at this piece, can you imagine if, if we went to the Museum of Fine Arts and I started taking out all the drawers and turning things? <laughs> it, it just wouldn't happen. But one of the reasons that uh, furniture um, over a period of decades, if not centuries, acquires color, it's the result of it, um, its surface uh, uh, being affected by the elements, whether it's wood smoke or coal heating. And with, sometimes you'll see drawers, that, a piece that has not been refinished and you'll see accumulation of oil and dirt. Um, you know, in certain areas of the drawers, you can see a drawer. Oftentimes you'll see a, a drawer that was maybe accessed by somebody who opened it with their left hand rather than their right. So oftentimes the surface of a piece can tell you whether the person was ambidextrous or, or not. Any other questions? Uh, the piece uh, at the Museum of Fine Arts that's like the, the uh, desk here, does it have the uh, decorations in the... Um, Loops, the rosettes, thank you. So what was that? The, the piece that you referenced that you said was similar to the gay desk, does that have the rosettes still on it at, at the Museum of Fine Arts? The, the one at the Museum of Fine Arts? Correct, yeah. I, yes, it does. I think that's, it, that's, I think that if somebody really wanted to do it, that those original details, if you will, the rosettes, um, they could be replicated. And you might say, well, there's no one who can do that anymore. Not true. There are some incredibly uh, talented uh, cabinet makers out there, uh, very talented carvers. You think of the North Bennett Street School. Um, if they said to somebody, make that, there are people out there who could do it. I think the perhaps uh, the difficulty would be finding uh, wood. Um, of that quality. It, it's almost non-existent. We've found that at auction now, people will buy early 19th century, like mahogany deep drop leaf, like banquet tables. And um, they're buying the table not to use as the table, they want the lumber. So they're, so it's it's almost akin to, you know, when the when silver was such at such a high level, uh, I remember talking to a dealer who would hang out at the place where they melt down silver and he would sit next to the conveyor belt and he would grab stuff. And he said, I'll pay more than the uh, meltdown. That kind of thing just makes you feel ill. 
but these big drop leaf tables and people don't, uh, the whole idea of having a dining room and uh, as a separate room and seat people in there, it's almost a thing of the past. I've gone on calls where they have said to me, I went on a call in Litchfield, Connecticut, and she said, Stephen, I want you to take these things. And I said, which? Everything in the dining room. She said, we don't use the room anymore. Rather a pity, I've got a dining room and I bet a lot of you have a dining room and you don't use it often, but when you do, it's special. Well, thank you, Steve. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. I was interested to know if you've encountered cedar on the inside of any other desk right. pieces. It struck me from the first time I saw it and I speculated that it perhaps was used uniquely in that to uh, try to deter uh, bug damage to the ledgers as they sat behind it. No, I, I think there's some truth to that. I've seen cedar used uh, for drawer interiors as well. So, so just, you know, people talk about that they have a hope chest and it's made out of cedar or has a cedar liner. There may have been a good reason to do that. And also it, it had a certain fragrance to it and uh, that, that might have made a difference as far as uh, what the interior smelled like when it was closed up for a considerable amount of time. Um, if, you, if you're furniture enthusiasts and you've inspected furniture in an antique shop or auction or whatever, um, to me, uh, that experience of, let's say, opening, they have wonderful tall clocks here, extraordinary tall clocks, but you open that waste door and it smells so good. I think it's an acquired taste. And when I was, when I was a young teenager, uh, I was interested in clocks. And some clocks, when you, when you open the door, they smelled horrible. And that I learned that it was rancid whale oil. Um, so I even got to like that after a while, you know. So sometimes literally the smell of a piece of furniture, whether the, an interior drawer or the interior of a clock, that sort of thing, that also offers you clues as to if it's if it's real or not and that's why things that are left with the original surface where you can see oxidation and the the result of all the elements have on the surface those that tells you very readily this thing's right as rain one more question from the audience here um this is probably i'm asking for a guess uh, but the first desk, uh, the gay desk, how long uh, did it take to make something like that in your estimation? How long did it take? Yeah. That's a great question. I would think months. I mean, it's tremendously labor intensive. Right. Um, and oftentimes cabinet makers had, you know, had people working with them too, especially a little bit later on. I mean, they talk about uh, Duncan Fife. He had a huge shop full of people making things. So there are cabinet makers who had apprentices and assistants. Um, so the gay desk was, was that all made by the same man or, or might it have been the combined talents of several people? I don't know if that's actually known. Um, as I understand it, he might've been the only one involved, but he might say, well, I don't need, I don't need to do the dovetailing. Somebody else can do that. Um, do we know that one way or another? No. So there's a lot, there's still a lot that we don't know. That's why when you find records of cabinet makers, they're so sought after because they tell us an awful lot. We've got a great deal to learn. It's a little ironic the further we get from when these th things were made, little by little, we're finding out about more about the people who made them, whether it was a collaborative effort, how long it might have taken. Um, so it's a good question. So there are a number of thank yous to make today. One is that this society benefits from the work of many, many volunteers. When you heard all that information that Paula shared, she was able to access that from records that were on paper, but many that have been digitized. Uh, we have a lot of records of these families and a lot of volunteer effort goes into preserving those records. So, so thank you to all of you who might be viewing today or in the room today who have contributed to that over time. It makes a difference when you're preparing a program like this today to understand the provenance and, and history of the families. 
Secondly, thank you to Paula for pulling all of that together so we would understand the family history. We've learned a lot about Hingham history as well as about beautiful pieces of furniture. And finally, Steve, it has been such a pleasure to get to know you a little bit. As Paula said, this was not your first trip here for, to work on this program with us. Thank you so very, very much. We have a, a really very modest token to give you that, that Ruth is gonna bring up to you. Uh, but this has just been a real gift. Um, and uh, thank you so much for bringing this to our large audience today. Thank you. And, and to, the, to those of you who are here at the museum, there's two things uh, we want to let you know about. One is on the second floor in what many of you know as the ballroom, there are some light refreshments available. And then as you go down to the, uh, as you go across, um, there, you can go into the Kelly Gallery. We will have someone there uh, to guide you. And you can see these th three pieces of furniture in person if you haven't looked at them recently. Uh, I found just when Steve was here doing the video, I had a whole new appreciation for them. And I, I expect everyone will have that same feeling when they go see them today. So have a little refreshment and stop at the Kelly Gallery. And thank you all for coming. And those of you on Zoom, thank you so very much all of you who subscribe to this series. Our next program in the series is in November, but as you're probably aware, a lot of exciting things happening for the Society in October. So stay abreast of everything on the website and have a good afternoon. Thank you.